Hello, everyone, and welcome to another book club meeting. Thank you for coming. Today, we are going to read excerpts from a new book, a book that I often compare with the Bible because I've never read it and because I think they're kind of like a similar size and shape, right? This one is called Historic Costume for the Stage, and it's written by Lucy Barton. There's Barton, last name, if you need the spelling. This is a book that I have had in my life for a very long time. I have carried it from hovel to hovel, and I've really never read a single word of it. This is one of those that I like to have on my shelf because I think it makes me look impressive. Someone comes in and they see this tome. They're like, that peasant really knows a lot about costume history. Rich! We know the truth. It was written in 1935 by Lucy Barton. I find myself like floating away as I'm reading some of the descriptions because I love my costume books to just be pictures. But it's great also to read. So this could be particularly ASMR in its quality for some people, including myself. I thought we could start with this foreword, actually, which was written by B. Iden Payne, and he brings up some interesting points. At the very beginning, he says, It is not sufficiently realized that costume is not accidental and arbitrary, but is founded upon a definite and psychological basis. Costume, in short, is the outward and visible sign of the inner spirit which informs any given period and nationality. The comparative uniformity of dress adopted by all people who have come under the influence of modern industrialization is a case in point, which is very true. And then there's some fighting words. I feel it says, for this reason, it is impertinent and generally disastrous for the designer of costumes for a historical play to utilize a superficial knowledge of the dressing of the period involved as an excuse for exercising his inventive faculties by the imposition of his own fanciful notions and embellishments and exaggerations. Which I understand what he's saying, but I'm also taking it as an attack. Moving on from him, let's get into Lucy's writing. After the foreword, we have the preface. And see, Lucy has some counterpoints, which I really appreciate. This edition allows space in this new preface to emphasize the contribution of costume to the total production of a play and to consider the, quote, why of period costumes for period plays. It is timely, for nowadays, the strictly archaeological approach to stage costuming is often belittled. When historically accurate costumes are also stodgy and meaningless, parentheses, as indeed they sometimes are, they had better be rejected. Literal copying is not, per se, theatrical truth. Already something to think about. Maybe I should have read this book earlier, some might say. All right, now we get to jump ahead to our time period, early Gothic, concerning the period. The common man whose life was hard and drab might at the cathedral get his fill of music and pageantry and color for he had rich costumes of the gentlefolk to gaze at if his mind should wander from the drama of the mass. I love the picture that creates. Here are the general characteristics of costumes, which we're just choosing the highlights of, because there's a lot of information in this book. Necklines were lower, not at first much lower, but even half an inch makes a difference. The heavy double sleeve went out in 1200, and the shape of the forearm and its long, Tight sleeve was revealed, though from shoulder to elbow might depend various floating draperies, as will be seen. So I think this is what she's talking about, our like tight forearm and then drapery from the shoulder. That's us. The crusades had introduced a simple system of distinguishing persons by means of emblems. Any crusader might wear the red cross on his breast. Such personal emblems were adopted by pilgrim warriors and from this custom developed the complications of heraldry. From being carried on by men and only on the surcoat or shield, this blazonry came to be used first on men's civil dress and finally on women's as well. After about 1250, this style had a firm hold on medieval costume. In the period we are discussing, the blazonry was large, occupying the front of a man's garment from neck to hip, or a woman's gown, skirt, bodice, or boat. And I think that's just great. I love the idea of these like large, graphic, illustrated features. We sort of need that, don't we? We need like a tassel, you know, 
blazonry, coat of arms. Though necks were not so well covered, arms were never bare, except, as explained in chapter five, for manual labor or an extreme negligee, which are two things I try to avoid. Heads were covered even more than in Romanesque times, men's as well as women's. That's why I wore my hat today. After 1300, the vogue changed very decidedly. Whereas from earliest times, the masculine dress of Europeans had been loose and easy, its tailoring never more intricate than that of a smock. Now garments were form-fitting, even in the skirts, having no superfluous fullness. Superfluous is like the word of book club right now. With the advent of short skirts, hose became very important to the well-dressed man. Cloth hose was lined and probably padded when the shape of the leg needed improving. That is great news. I love that. Because, you know, I mean, I like my legs, but could they be improved? Yes. Do I intend to exercise? But this I like where you just pad your leggings to get that shape. I like that a lot. They knew what they were doing. The fashion for party colored garments included hose in the divided arrangement. And that party colored garment is something that I love where you have like two different colored stockings, one on each leg, and then you have opposite sleeves that are the same colors but reversed. I don't have an outfit like that yet, but we gotta get on that, that's the best. This next section is called practical reproduction. And although that sounds very practical, this is where Lucy really gets into the drama. When you costume a play in this period, it is sure to be a romantic play. Think of the type of feminine beauty you should try to reproduce. Small, sleek heads, high foreheads, long white necks and sloping shoulders, long arms with tapering, gym-laden hands. Think of the ideal men as being tall and slender, graceful, as well as strong and bold. The costumer has at her command to create this illusion. Draperies falling from the shoulder, sweeping trains and rippling capes. Along with this beautiful simplicity of line, she will avail herself of brilliant colors, alone or in combination. Remembering in particular the excellent effect obtained with contrasting linings of mantles, cloaks, and surcoats. Pretty good. It's true though, a contrasting lining on like a cloak when you, and then suddenly the inside of it, it's like a bright green or something. It's a moment. That's all I'm going to read about early Gothic. But then I found this section in the back under some notes on construction of costume that was really written for us. It's called Differences Between Costumes for Pageants and Those for Dramas. It's four parts. Number one. The drama is usually played indoors by artificial light, so like a play. The pageant is frequently performed outdoors, sometimes in daylight. In daylight, the colors used must be simple, direct, and primitive, with probably a predominance of warm tones, such as red and yellow, to be seen in contrast to the blue sky and green foliage. That's so smart. Thinking about like, you've already got blues and greens in your color palette, for free, so maybe like put more into like your reds and yellows. Number two, the drama is seen at a comparatively close range and texture and finish count for much. Since the pageant is seen at a distance, all that carries is color and general line. Color on an individual costume should not be complicated. It is usually best to employ not more than two in a costume, which I have learned this the hard way. When you put all these bright colors onto one costume, it just gets muddled. All effective details of silhouette, especially of the principal characters, should be exaggerated. See, Lucy is giving me license to a dream, unlike that guy in the... She says, skirts and trains, extra long. Hats, extra high. Sleeves, extra large. Thank you, Lucy. I will. Number three, the drama deals with individuals and each costume is usually unique while the pageant deals with groups, often using many people in identical costumes. Yes, variety in pageant costumes comes from masses of colors more than from details in cut, which is good for me to remember, because sometimes I do get lost in all the little details, tassels. But really, it's like, if we're going to have like 18 people playing this one gesture of visuals, that's more important. Number four, last one. The drama is frequently played a number of times and the costumes are made to last for the run and perhaps to be used in subsequent plays. The pageant is played once or twice and the costumes are generally not used again. Well, 
Ours will be. Pageant costumes can therefore be made of cheap materials, true, provided they give the suitable effect by their draping quality or their stiffness. Pageant costumes may be turned out with raw edges, well, and only enough stitching to hold them together. Solid, but not elegant. I would like a little elegance. That, but that's just me. This is just my opinion. I hear what Lucy's saying, and she's right. Strangely enough, in Congress details, for example, anachronisms such as wristwatches and fraternity pins are very noticeable and as distracting on a pageant stage as behind theater footlights. We're going to need to put that in the memo. If I see any fraternity pins in our pageant, you're out. I know, that's harsh. Amazing. Well, thank you, Lucy. I am thrilled we got to spend some time with her. I think it really is wonderful. We will return to read about her section on late Gothic costume. Thank you for encouraging me to keep going with this series. We will return to Tassel soon, I promise, and to the Incorruptible Saints. We've got a lot of other books to explore as well. So thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon.